Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to The Care Review, the online social care chat show, raising a platform for social care issues for absolutely everybody. Before we get started, um, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that bell, um, and the views discussed in tonight's show are of our own and not our respected companies. Um, Going to do something a little bit different tonight, um, and I think we will add them to our names once we've announced or once we've done it, because we're talking about gender tonight, we're talking about uh, LGBTQIA plus awareness, we're going to be talking about pronouns. So we're going to start with our own pronouns this evening as well, just to get the conversation started. So I'm Adam Pennell, he, him. I'm Dawn Bunter, she, her. Mute. I can't unmute myself, but I'm hot hot <laughs> and I am he, him. <laughs> Good evening, both of you. So like a bat out of hell, we have entered a new week. And we are down one fantastic rock star. And I can't even tell you. I was driving back from Buckinghamshire last week on the Monday. And I was wailing to Meatloaf all the way home. Unbeknownst to me that a few days later he would no longer be with us. Um, so, you know, quite sad. And then within the same period we find out Boris Johnson's been at another party. Um, what do we think? Can I just say, I thought Meatloaf died years ago i thought he was like born in like the 40s or something so <laughs> it came definitely as a shock to me but probably not for the right reasons but yeah so <laughs> i don't think he was far off the 40s if you are a big meatloaf fan then adam what was it that he couldn't do because he could do anything for love but he wouldn't do that what is that now if you ask me after a couple of glasses of wine and at a party doing karaoke, I'd probably give you some blue crude answer because there's many things people many things people will do and they won't do it for love. Um, I always took it that he wouldn't cheat because she sings, when, when they're singing, she sings something in line saying sooner or later we'll be fooling around and he's like, well, I won't do that. So I always took it that he'll do anything, but he won't be cheating or messing around. I don't fully know. I know it's a topic of you know, huge discussion, and it's probably going to go along the lines of um, Atlantis in, you know, a good couple of hundred years' time. People are going to be searching for Atlantis and the answer to Meatloaf's song. Um, but that's how I took it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I tell you what he wouldn't do. He wouldn't attend Boris Johnson's birthday party. Now, I can tell you that for a fact. Um, what do we reckon? Is it time for him to go? To prison, no. <laughs> it's time for him to go months ago, weren't it? To be quite honest, that man has been to more parties in the pandemic than I've been in my whole entire life. <laughs> Seriously. How, how many parties can one building have? Honestly, I, I, I was trying to work it out today how many parties I've probably been to because I never really had birthday parties as a kid because my birthday's at the end of August, so everybody used to forget in the summer holidays. So I never really had birthday parties. So when I'm working it out, he he literally has attended more parties during the pandemic than I ever have. And I'm 42 years old. So no wonder he and no wonder he was so poorly all the time. And no wonder he had COVID and was pinged left, right and centre because he's going out all the time and getting sloshed and having birthday cakes and interior designers buying him gifts. No, I'm done. I was done last week and the week before and the week before that. But Everybody knows my feelings in respect of our Prime Minister, and I think it's time he just stepped back and let somebody else take on the reins of getting us through the last era of what I hope is the pandemic. I mean, the irony of it is they're so hell-bent on having parties in, in number 10 that you'd think that they'd be willing to cross-party work and try and find solutions to things. But they don't. They just want parties with wine and cheese because it's a working event. Heaven forbid we have cross-party working. So, I mean, that was one bombshell that we've, we've had recently. The other, um, which uh, we'll probably have to discuss in, in length at some point, is the revelation that they may not mandate the vaccine for NHS because of fear of losing up to 70,000 staff from their workforce. And yet, doesn't seem to be a backtrack on care home mandates. And, and as far as I've read, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, they've not mentioned about the wider social care sector having it paused either. Um, now, I know, Mark, you're in the independent talking about this on, and on carehome.co.uk. So what are your thoughts? I think whilst I can understand them wanting to backtrack because obviously they are going to lose a lot of staff from the NHS which is just going to add you know more pressure to the staff that are vaccinated and remain in the in their sector 
I think it just puts a further disparity between health and social care. So I think when the home, where the care home rollout happened, we saw a lot of staff move from social care into the NHS. And then obviously the NHS consultation came around and those staff obviously were like, well, actually, there's no point in me going there because I'm going to just have to be jabbed there. And I think then a lot went into home care and then obviously it happened in home care. And I think if they end up not doing one and doing the other, those staff will just move from whichever sector it is into the other because it's just the natural place to go to continue in their career. Um, but yeah, I think if they do one, they need to do all of them. And I think if they then pause the home care one, they also then need to do a reverse decision on the care home one because then equally just get staff in the care homes that then come into home care, which then leaves the problem further down the line there. Oh, you're on mute now, Adam, as well. <laughs> uh, talking about, with, with the, I was at a thing about uh, presenting in public speaking this morning. The number one, we, oh, I was saying was don't drink fizzy drinks. I've drunk a Coke, so I'm trying not to burp live on air. Uh, and the app, uh, and then the uh, Dr. Pepper. <gasps> mix oh, it with I a, love a Dr. Pepper. Mix it with a Sprite, you get a Sprepper. Um, but um, also not muting yourself and, and, and failing to unmute yourself. Um, but surely when we're talking about parity and working together and, you know, all three of us, as well as a lot of the social care sector, are doing a lot of work to make sure the NHS and social care can work together. And we will be discussing this in the near future. This is going to do nothing but damage the relationship between the two. Dawn, do you have anything? Because I know it was you I and mean, you brought my attention to this over the weekend, so... I, th I just think that all, the, all those staff that left social care, and I think I, got, I was trying to find out today roughly on average how many people who left the sector or who were dismissed from the sector moved on to the NHS. And I think it was something like 46% of those that left. They, they're not going to come back to social care. They've worked for the NHS now, so they're not going to return, even if there is a change of, they, even if there is a change of mind. They're getting paid better. Their hours are probably better. They've got a better pension. You know, at the end of the day, we've lost them now, even if there is that change. I think that, and this is why those outside of social care look on it with a ne negative connotation, because now that it has been a stepping stone for many. Um, and I think, it, I just find it upsetting that there needs to be, like you say, there needs to be some kind of parity in respect of, if they're going to do this for the NHS, they have to. They have to U-turn on social care. If not, you are going to have. I was speaking to somebody today in respect of this um, who studied law, and he said, "If not, you are going to have so many where you sat from your job because you wouldn't have a vaccine. No win, no fee. Come and see me. Let's take these people to court." And it's not necessarily going to be on the government that this type of thing happens. It's going to be on the providers themselves who can't afford to have that kind of action being taken. Um, so it's just a waiting game, really. Did they give a date on when they're making that decision or have an understanding of when it could be? No, although Sajid Javid has said today that all staff will need to have both vaccines in the NHS and social care. So he's saying that he's still backing the mandate, but whether that is his ultimate, if he's the decision maker or not, I don't know, or whether it comes from further afield if there's a lot of pressure. But He's just planning on becoming prime minister, so he, he's, he's trying not to ruffle any feathers at the minute. He's like, well, Bojo's going to be out soon, so I need to make sure that, that people still like me so I can take the top <laughs> spot. <laughs> I, mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, going back to old Boris Johnson... I think the problem is whoever we get to replace him needs to be somebody that's not on those front benches or on his first like in, on his inner circle because they're all complicit in it as much as he is. They all attended those parties or one of them, so they're all lying at some point. But yeah, well, oh, never a dull day in the social and healthcare sector. I've started doing that as well. I've started switching the social and health around, you know, to uh, to try and swap things up a little bit. In fact, I actually forgot to say um, health and social care secretary when I would refer to Sajid the other week. I called him the, the, the social care secretary, which didn't go down very well with uh, the people I was talking to. Um, no doubt that the public inquiry, uh, once those terms of references are set up, will uh, address some of these issues. I do agree, though, Dawn, there's going to be a number of of legal lawsuits coming coming forward over the next few years. I mean, I'm still waiting for the advert of where you uh, sold uh, missold PPE 
instead of PPI. I mean, it, it sells itself, doesn't it? I don't know why that, that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Will you miss sold PPE? <laughs> oh, like, like this guy I was talking to today said, oh, were you not given enough? Did you catch COVID? This is gonna this is gonna be a minefield, an absolute yeah, this is gonna be an absolute minefield in, in a few years to come. And he is waiting for it. He is waiting for this crescendo of legal ability that the general public are gonna have, especially those that work in the sector. Did you not have enough PPE? Did you not do this? Did you not do that? The more and more inquiries there are and the more information that's given out to the public the more legal standing they have. So watch this space in a few years' time, I think. I also yeah. think that if they backtrack on the mandate, how many staff would say, well, I only have the vaccine because otherwise I was going to lose my job and now I didn't even need to have the vaccine. They are in a very tricky situation. I think the problem is they sell something, don't they, as the right idea. It's obviously not the right idea. And then they still have to carry on with it while trying to fudge it. <laughs> fudge it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, conversely, Mark, you know, I only have the vaccine to, to keep my job. I lost my job because I didn't have the vaccine. And now I don't need the vaccine to work. And I was made unemployed. There's there's so many sort of sticky situations now moving forwards. And the fact that it's actually in law is just going to make things worse. I mean, is it from tomorrow? Masks in indoor places are no longer going to be mandatory. They're talking about lifting isolation in March for people with covid um, and as far as I'm aware, the COVID laws or um, well, the powers that they've got with the COVID powers run out in March time, don't they? Um, so presumably, if they let those lapse and don't vote them back in, any further um, strains or outbreaks or, or pandemics of, of anything moving forward of COVID-wise, they're going to have to re-vote back in. So it's going to be an interesting couple of months to see what happens interesting interesting so should we get on with tonight sure let's get on let's get on so tonight we have a a a, a, a real expert in their field um lecturer at uh, arden university we have phil harper with us now uh, if anyone wants to ask phil questions or talk about phil in the comments as we've spoken about our our pronouns tonight phil does go by they them um and uh well first off good evening phil um how are you I remember to unmute myself how many meetings I've been in today and I've been talking away and not been unmuting myself, which probably isn't a bad thing, I'll be honest. Um, but yeah, hello. I'm very good. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. So, Phil, give us a quick background in, in, in what you do, what you're doing at the moment, your relation to, to dementia. Um, and then I think we should start off discussing pronouns. And for everyone that's watching who might not know what they are, what they mean, um, and, and a little bit like that. So what do you do, Phil? Fantastic. So thank you. My So I'm a senior lecturer and programme lead at Arden University. I am running their brand new apprenticeship. I don't even know if I'm allowed to really say too much about it, but I will. Um, but, and I'm actually really focusing, so my background is social care focused, and I'm actually fighting for the apprenticeship to work for the social care side because very much traditionally our university has been very healthcare based but they're very very keen on supporting the social care um sector and to try and everything you've been saying about this kind of cinderella service that the social care sector is compared to the healthcare sectors we want to try and actually provide a good course and a good apprenticeship particularly for registered managers and that's definitely something i can always discuss more at maybe another day um, once we know what our apprenticeship really looks like but um but that's what i do so i'm a senior lecturer there my background is dementia care i've worked in dementia care for about 10 11 years now um and i'm currently doing my doctorate where i'm looking particularly at gender neutrality and non-binary identities within care and how quite often due to either patholo pathologization, I can't even say it, um, actually quite often erases these identities and we quite often don't provide appropriate support and we commit microaggressions. But there's also cultural issues within care around this. So that's really what, I, um, what I'm looking at. Um, and yeah, so I think that's me. And yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to talk about um, pronouns because I know we're having a bit of a chat before and saying about how I use they, them pronouns and I'm non-binary. 
but even I don't know the long list of all the different pronouns. And I think the important thing about that is, is they're so individual. And that's what's important is that we shouldn't be assuming other people's pronouns. We should allow people to identify with what pronouns they want and they identify as. Um, and it's fine to ask, oh, what are your pronouns and what do your pronouns mean? Because most of us don't mind explaining, particularly if we've got some that are a little bit less common. Yeah, I think there's definitely a generational thing here. Um, there's definitely a, um, a, a an alien sense of this to some people. Um, so for us, it's quite it's quite natural now to be able to go. You know, do you go? You know, even to what name do you go by? You know, you don't want to dead name somebody. You don't want to use a name that somebody doesn't doesn't like using. Um, so yeah, some of the pronouns we were talking about. You've got uh, Z here, Z um, him. He, him, but spelt with a Y instead of an I, um, and co-cos, and they're part of the 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 the, the gender fluid non-binary um, set of pronouns, aren't they? Um, so, Phil, obviously, you, you were talking about um, how you identify as non-binary. Um, non-binary, as far as I'm aware, so please educate me if I'm wrong, is a umbrella term for uh, different gender uh, identities. Um, or non-gender conforming um, identities. So do you want to just give us a bit of a background on what non-binary is and how it differs from things like agender and, and gender fluid? So, yeah, exactly what you said. Um, non-binary is an umbrella. So I'm actually agender. I I believe that gender is a social construct and I believe we are biological markers, but I believe the whole idea of gender is just a form of population control. But I won't go into that because I'll be ranting all night and you'll I'll be cracking out the gin and it will not go in a good place so I won't go too much into that but yeah but non-binary is an umbrella term so you've got many other identities under that a bit like trans is the wider umbrella so for some people who are non-binary they identify as trans because trans as an umbrella just means that you are not you don't identify with the sex you're assigned at birth um so a lot of non-binary people don't because you don't identify on the binary but some people don't identify with the trans umbrella because they feel like they don't have the trans experience and that's absolutely fine it's very individual and when we think about labels it's very much about what you self-identify as um, and it can make it incredibly complicated and sexuality and gender identity is incredibly complicated but I think it's about not assuming and it's about asking questions I think that's the easiest way to overcome it really is not to assume that you know what somebody's gender identity or sexuality is but ask questions and have the ability for people to self-disclose I think is really important but other non-binary as you said um, gender fluid quite often used under the non-binary umbrella and that's where people quite often are on like a sliding scale of what they identify as on the binary and also out of the binary um, and then you've got a gender where people don't identify with a gender and then you've got other and you just get you sometimes got like first nation third genders so you've got the two spirit people in native america and the fifth yeah. in the south pacific for example which are other third genders, and they are counted as non-binary, but it shouldn't be used as synonymous just for non-binary either, because, as I said, there's people like myself who don't identify as a third gender, but still will come under the non-binary umbrella. And this, I think, is where the, the Western society fails slightly, because we have, like you say, got these gender constructs, and uh, we'll uh, very briefly leave this in, in a second, um, but I just want to touch upon the, the whole twin spirits from Native America, because I think it just shows that actually this is something spiritual and has been around for, you know, for as long as we can we can think of and in in gender and, and identity is is what we impose upon ourselves and i think it's it's uh i think it's fan fantastic that these conversations are happening and do you think this is more than just being woke do you think this is something that is going to apply to future society now or do you think it's something that will peter off as quick as it's it sort of um appeared i i think it is here for the long term because i don't think if we look at other cultures, as you mentioned, that do look at gender and even sexuality slightly differently, they are existing perfectly fine with seeing it that way. This whole idea of it being woke slash cancel culture, all of these ideas, everybody being a snowflake, all this, 
it's it's quite frustrating because all we're doing is we're learning more about the social construction of gender and it's a bit frustrating to see that people will sometimes just push new knowledge but i think quite often people are scared of new knowledge and i think that's totally understandable when it's so complicated um but i do think also a lot of people particularly academics in this area really don't make it very accessible and i'm probably going to upset a lot of people now um i'm, I'm not going to get any collaborations now look at this i'll be um out of a job soon but i think a lot of particularly gender and sexuality studies academics make it so really struggle to make it accessible and i think that's part of the problem and i think it's just important to try and just make it as simple as possible but obviously you can't make it fully simple but make the key take-home messages simple yeah there's a cracking episode of um, and i'm going to geek out here now crack cracking episode of star trek next generation uh gene rodenbury huge visionary for a future that was going to be utopian and people would love and live and and laugh as as much as they want to to do in in, in non-discriminatory ways then there was an episode where Riker, because Riker was a complete womanizer as he was um met an androgynous race um of people um there was no gender within their society they were all androgynous um and obviously fell in love with this androgynous person. And I think it was the first time really, I mean, Star Trek had its first interracial case, because I think when we talk about LGBTQIA, we also need to discuss EDI as, as a whole. Um, so Star Trek had its first interracial case, but it also had many sort of um, non-gender conforming storylines throughout the next generation, showing that actually this possibly... Tonight, Dawn, Mark and I found it easy to give our pronouns. What sort of advice could you give us? Obviously, populations are aging now and people who live in care homes, and I'm sure Mark will probably want to touch on this later on, especially uh, um, working age adult homes, there's probably a higher uh, proportion of, of LGBTQIA plus people in, 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 in adult working force homes, but uh, adult working age homes. For elderly homes, how do we as managers, how do we as as uh, assesses how do we broach the topic about gender pronouns and um, sexual that's not going to offend someone um, and is inclusive in the way that we do it um i think for me we we always ask i know all my early dementia training sessions when i was just starting out in care i remember the key thing being ask how somebody wants to be referred to as and that was always a big thing, because sometimes you have people who like to just be known as their middle name. You've got the older generation that generally will have a nickname that just doesn't make any sense. It's like not their first name. And that's quite a generational thing. So it was very much about actually ask if somebody's from the forces, they might like to know their their rank. And it's exactly the same. It's just about how would you like to be referred to as what what shall I call you because that still opens up a very neutral way of asking how do you want me to refer to you as and you can have discussions and um, something I always really talk about when I talk about having these discussions is about speak positively about people from different backgrounds and it's exactly the same as or I agree with what you said about EDI that this works for pretty much all protected characteristics if we speak positively and we have what I'd call positive discourse or positive discussions around this we create a really welcoming environment where people don't feel judged so somebody might be very free to say what they feel and who they are but also I think it is just key about asking people how they like to be referred to as. And I think also having the norm, like saying the norms, just have pronouns, the norm, have it on badges. OK, people might not be able to read it, but if somebody, if one person in that care home can read it and they don't identify as you've done an amazing thing for that one person. So it's things that don't hurt the other way that we can adopt. But I think it's just about being open about going back to the basics in person-centered care really and in one way not over again not over complicating it i think adam touched on it with working age adults and a lot of my background has been with learning disabilities and the younger generation and i think whether it's because they're not as socially aware of kind of how people perceive them and they don't kind of have that kind of conscious that people might judge them so much I think they do identify however they want to identify and I think they kind of just take it kind of in their walk of life very obviously conscious that people in members of the public don't see it quite that way how would yeah. you um 
advise people that say, especially for elderly care, obviously, as we see more and more people with dementia maybe come out later in life or identify differently than they would have done beforehand. What would your advice be on how you manage that between kind of the family that have one expectation, the person that has their own expect or their new expectation in their kind of dementia, and obviously the staff member that's stuck in the middle between the family and the individual they're supporting? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the hardest questions, really, because I haven't got any clear cut advice. I think it's mainly about focusing on the person you're caring for, because without meaning it in a harsh way, the person you're caring for is the person that is most important. But that doesn't mean totally neglecting the family, because the family obviously are still incredibly important. So it's about maybe having discussions, talking about maybe educating the family, you can point point and signposts into resources the people like the Alzheimer's Society and a lot of other organizations opening doors London tonic housing there's loads of organizations out there now that um, provide um, literature and support for older people um, who are LGBTQ plus and it could be about just signposting saying this is maybe why you didn't know about this because that sometimes from people like families I've spoken to, a lot of the upset comes from the fact that they just didn't know. And for them, it just comes out of the blue. And I think if you can signpost to resources that explain why this might have happened, that takes a little bit of that animosity away. Um, but I also think here also it's really important to know that actually sometimes, I, and I don't know if anybody out there or any of you have experience this if you've been if you know that you've supported somebody who's lgbtq plus um that actually they're more likely to be single and they're more likely to not have close family around them um and but they do have their close family they have what we call a family of choice and this is sometimes becomes erased and actually about understanding that somebody might not be in close terms or maybe slightly estranged from their family um, and they might actually have a really close friendship group and I think it's about looking at the wider view of family sometimes as well when we think about providing support so I've kind of gone on a tangent but hopefully that is like I haven't got any really because it, it's a really difficult question and it's very situation specific but I think you do need to support both but you do need to hold really the needs of the person you're supporting and who is coming out first which can sometimes be quite challenging if you've got a very upset family member yeah i think it depends on where the person lives as well i think if they're in a care home away from their family it's really slightly easier to kind of have that conversation with family on the side and then the person you support i think if you're looking after somebody in their own home that is living with a husband or wife and then that's kind of all going on as soon as that next of kin doesn't agree with you they're not on the phone to another provider because they don't want you because you don't agree with them and then it, the conversation just starts again with another provider down the road so you don't actually get to the yeah. bottom of it but, and i'm hoping that's where maybe the education and the signposting to resources just to say these and you could even signpost to there there's um the lgbt foundation i believe have a helpline opening door london's have a helpline and you can maybe signpost to them and just say they'll happily listen to your worries and they might then be able to be, they might have the time to be able to explain things through in a quite a supportive way, which might help. Because the helplines are there also for family members too. And are there any organisations, so I have seen on social media, sorry Adam, um, that there have been times when family members don't agree with somebody, obviously, identifying as something else and then kicking them out of the family home because actually they see it as kind of like actually you've left me or it's kind of like a breakup and they kick the person out living with dementia or, or their condition onto the street they don't have a home is there then an organization that can support that person that is then deemed as homeless or the family obviously have just kind of disowned them um so a lot of just generally the homelessness charities will help and support their are are organisations that do a little bit of work around. So you've got Stonewall Housing, which do a little bit of work around LGBT ageing and housing. And I don't, don't know too well what their actual provision is, but they do 
they do do a lot of work around that area. So I'm sure they would provide services. You got um, organisations like the Guinness Foundation, the LGBT Foundation, Opening Doors London. These are all charities that focus on ageing and LGBT issues. So I'm sure they would be fantastic at signposting, and they would have resources and they would have people who can support with that. So, but it's like anything, the signposting to these organisations isn't there. So there's pretty much organizations for everything out there it's the signposting that's normally the issue i think it's as well for the carers looking after them it's about the carer knowing that they can signpost to these so it's about knowing that organization even exists in the first place yeah that's it sorry the only thing i was going to say and it was it was on a previous conversation and i think the signposting obviously is, is super important and i'm trying to put some of the websites in the in the comments now for the the managers and whoever might be watching tonight um the one thing that i've just thought about as you were discussing relations and and um family and people who are important circles of support etc i think the other thing we need to uh, recognize without adding more stigma to an already stigmatized community is a lot of people who will be aging now in the lgbtqis plus community will have lost a lot of friends during the aids pandemic as well and what we might find with them um advancing in dementia is trauma informed care yeah. in regards to such a huge amount of loss so early on in life because mm -hmm. you know touch what the majority of us don't really face our first death until our teens whether it be a grandparent or, mm -hmm. or something and then as we get older you know unless you work in care or health mortality isn't something you really address mm -hmm. until you get to, to your older mm -hmm. older years but for for this community there was a lot of death a lot of sadness and yeah a lot of stigma that came with it so trauma in coming out trauma in losing family through um your your um orientation and then trauma through uh losing people through hiv i just think it's a, an interesting thing that probably needs talking about at some point um yeah no uh, can i just add to that that is incredibly important and when we think about that trauma you've also got so you've got people who are maybe in the older state ages of being in social care that would have maybe still just been alive when it was illegal maybe experienced a lot of aggression a lot of abuse from the police people they should have trusted then they went through the AIDS pandemic then they went through section 28 a lot of older people now haven't had a break it's this it has been an absolute bombardment of abuse really and I think that's what we need to remember is that actually this trauma is significant so I think that is a really, really important point. And can we just mention that? It, was it 2003 that Section 28 finally disappeared? 2003. I think, it's then, yeah. I think it's absolutely. So again, I, I'm I'm terrible. I'm, I am obviously part of the LGBTQIA plus community. I don't know the full ins and outs. So again, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil. But wasn't there a thing with Section 28 where it was deemed not allowed to be teaching people or promoting homosexual mm -hmm. or um, uh, LGBTQIS education within mm -hmm. schools and to young people, um, which yeah. in itself traumatised a lot of people. You know, if I, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've known since I was six, and if I'd have had studies when I was six year old in, in school or it was on the curriculum, you know, mm -hmm. Clifford the Big Red Dog and, and Gay Pride, you know, Clifford the multicolored dog, whatever, I, I probably would have had a, a better coming out. So, you know, multiply that for the, the generations that have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Absolutely crazy. So obviously tonight we, we want to talk about microaggressions. Microaggressions um, aren't synonymous to uh, the LGBTQIS plus community. They are to do with anything when we talk about EDI. Um, but do you want to just give us a quick explanation of what microaggressions are and and maybe some examples of how it does affect or you know that examples of microaggressions that exist within care settings or within social care yeah of course so so yeah microaggressions they actually developed from um race studies and from racism um and then it's been like um everything the scholars looking at racism have been incredibly pioneering with edi stuff um so basically it's subtle forms of aggressions or forms of discrimination and it quite often comes from a lack of understanding or a person's own privilege and 
whenever I say the word privilege, I always hear gasps. And it's like, privilege is not an attack. If anything, I use it as a defense. I'm like, you've been a little bit of a nasty person, but maybe you don't mean it. Maybe you don't realize. Um, and I think it's really important to know that actually we can't have lived experience of absolutely everything. So our I, in my life, I will commit microaggressions. Everybody does. It's just something. But hopefully when we become aware of them, we can change and we can become better. Um, so some examples that I, so some of the key ones I always say is that when, if you're in a care home, for example, and somebody gets admitted and let's say it's somebody who is male presenting and states that they identify as a man, you might then ask them, oh, so have you got a wife? And that is literally the textbook microaggression, because what I'm doing is I'm assuming, and this is also heterosexual, which is also in the title, it's assuming heterosexuality and championing it and only really providing support for that. Um, and it's microaggression and it's heteronormativity, and they kind of go hand in hand. Um, now, there was a team of researchers, now I haven't got it in front of me, so I'll probably forget one of the items off it. I always do whenever I teach the Mental Capacity Act anything. I always miss one. It's always very frustrating. But there was a team of researchers, they're called Nadal and their team, and they pretty much said what an LGBTQ microaggression looks like. And they say it's imagery that is not inclusive. They state it's heteronormativity or heterosexual assumptions. Um, they state it's labels and not using labels correctly. And then they also explore the idea of um, not understanding that somebody has individualistic needs and individual experiences. So this is pretty much what a microaggression is. It's quite often just based on creating a service or provision based just on, let's say, cisgendered heterosexual people. And that's kind of where the microaggressions come from. So it's about looking broader and actually looking at different things. So another example I've got um, that I actually spoke to somebody in a care home afterwards, and, it, and I'll say about the quote, and it really kind of haunts me to this day a little bit, is um, when we think about posters for Valentine's Day, they're quite often very heteronormative. You've got your lovely the activities coordinator who's doing the best work and they're doing incredible and they've created the most beautiful poster but it's all men and women and how exclusive exclusive that is or excluding that is um i spoke to somebody who really quite shortly after um valentine's day lost their their husband in a um care home and he said I, I said, oh, but you had Valentine's Day together. I, I know the care home done a tea party. He was like, oh, no, I didn't go. All the pictures had heterosexual couples on, and my husband didn't think I'd be welcome. And he literally passed away a couple of weeks after that, and it literally destroyed me because it's just the thought, something that the activity corner was not meaning to do anything wrong. There, there was no intention there to exclude, but what they've done has had massive consequences and i think that's why um microaggressions are so important so many people say to me oh but it's the main aggression we should be focusing on and i'm like no it should be all of it um and these small things do lead sometimes to big events and i think that's why it's so important and i i mean lord knows if anyone knows me and dawn we love the c word um no not that one not co-production um <laughs> culture you know in social care we love the word culture we want culture to be you know absolutely something that that takes on board and this for me is, is where culture has failed because this person especially during the pandemic when people are losing people and they're not even being able to connect um in in any connection whatsoever to have a culture fail in a home where they don't feel welcome is quite upsetting and i think one of the things i would like to bring up is i've known through conversations with people in the past where i've gone you know what what do you do to make sure that your service is inclusive oh well we've got nobody who's gay that lives with us you know we've got no lesbians that live with us we've got nobody that's lgbtqia that lives with us and that's absolutely fine, but it's about making sure that our services have that culture in place so it's it's not reactive when someone moves in and is grasping at things to make sure that that culture is there. Because if we can make sure that our culture is there and we are 
culturally diverse and we are diverse and inclusive in all angles then it will work to our benefits and it'll be it become a natural part of, of life so what are some easy changes that managers or, or care settings could do phil um in regards to culture and i, I also want to just mention memory lanes um oh. <laughs> if there's anything that can be done with with memory lanes and and making people feel inclusive well let's go on the changes for culture first so um so yeah so when we're thinking about changes for culture it's just about showing that you're accepting and making it very clear so i'm actually going to use a bit of theory here which might scare some people off so i do apologize and that's not me trying to assume that people can't deal with theory it's just normally it's when i normally put people to sleep um so there's a theorist or sociologist called foucault who very much talks about self-regulation and he uses a um, analogy of panopticon, which is a round prison. So if, we th if you think of the Colosseum and you've got a central watcher in the middle um, and what Foucault says is that we all self-regulate because when you think about society being that central watcher and because a central watcher in the middle of a round prison can watch anybody at one time, we even when we're not being watched, we self-regulate um, because we are scared of being watched. And when we think about care cultures, we've got got to think that actually it's down to the staff the people at the top everybody to make sure that that watcher isn't being isn't persecuting with its watching basically and it's about thinking about how do we make that watcher not heteronormative um so in this case so it can be around having imagery now as much as I really appreciate the NHS having the rainbow, it's really undone a lot of our work in recent years. We fought so hard to get the rainbow into health and social care, and then COVID comes along and then they've adopted it. And even some organisations have even taken the pride flag. And it's just a bit, a little bit frustrating, I'll be honest. But I, I'm not one of these people who's very possessive over the rainbow. It's just, it had a very, it was very impactful before, and we kind of lost that a little bit. But it, it's about having discussions. Um, something I love is Care Pride. Um, I'm actually a part-time drag queen, and I have called out to a lot of care homes. A few have spoken to me about going in, and I will do like a sing-along in drag with the old songs. And not being funny, the residents will love that. Like They, they might not um, always appreciate that there's a drag queen in front of them, but as soon as the old song comes on, as we all know who's worked, in social care the old songs come on and the singing starts so it'll be a good laugh but also for the people who maybe are appreciating what's going on that could be incredibly affirming um and so we've got things like care prize that are really amazing because then they show this conversation now um somebody said to me about what about in home care because quite often home care gets ignored with these discussions but what happens when your local pride is on why don't you put the tv on and say how fantastic that is you might not get the response you actually want but if you do that to everybody and one person maybe is lgbtq plus and they don't feel comfortable they might actually really appreciate you doing that even though you might have to hear people who do struggle with the concept so it's that type of thing that actually you can still do these similar type of things, create these conversations, create this welcoming environment. And I think once you start doing this and once you also start embedding everything. So this isn't just about just doing it, all the positive work about being inclusive, not assuming gender, respecting pronouns, um, not um, just um, having heterosexual couples on um the posters for pride this is about doing it all the time and i think that's then when the culture starts to come is that actually when this becomes a normal practice and you start normalizing this practice it becomes an inclusive practice so i think with culture it's very much that but it needs to be a top down so the people at the top need to really support this and um i i know of some fantastic care assistants who work in a care home and they said our manager just doesn't really see the importance of it. And that's going to be really quite disempowering. So I think this needs to be at all levels and it just needs to be supported and not be a tick box. So audits are really useful for checking if things are going on, but it should also be about getting a feel for what's happening. Actually, are you having fun with it too? So I said the care prides are quite often a fun way to that everybody can be involved in. It's funny you should say that because uh, I will always remember 
um, we're talking about it top down and it being culture embedded within. I remember when um, uh, same sex marriage was being legalized in the country and they were all voting on it. And I said to one of my colleagues who was above me at the time, I said, oh, I can't believe this is this is like absolutely life affirming. This is this is groundbreaking. This is this is life changing. It's going to be fantastic. And all I got back was, oh, Adam, do you not think there's more important things going on in the world at the moment than gay marriage? Mm-hmm. And you're doing you automatically, you get taken back, don't you? You get knocked back mm-hmm. from that that pride and that and that joy. But do you think there's something in homes becoming ally homes? Um, so I know there was a lot of confusion when the A got added to LGBTQIA. Uh, plus, A stands for, for asexual, it doesn't stand for ally, um, but allies are people who stand by um, hmm. by races, by by minorities and, and are supporters. So is there something that exists for care homes to become ally homes, um, similar to Purple Tuesday, where organisations become disability hmm. organisations? Yeah, 100%. So they're called, it's called Pride in Practice. Now, I believe, I'm trying to remember the two names. So Opening Doors London have won um and i believe that is also pride i believe that's pride in practice and basically they will help train staff they will help you to develop ideas and um do some fantastic work with the games to make sure on care settings not just and they do also work with home care as well to see about working with the staff and how these things can go about and they give you accreditation then you get this stamp that you can put on everything to say that you are lgbt friendly um and then okay yeah and then i've seen you put the lgbt foundation i maybe um the opening doors london one is slightly different name i know there's two the lgbt foundation also do one the lgbt foundation one i believe is more healthcare focused from what i have seen but they do do social care too whereas opening doors london is a little bit more social care focused but then also stonewall housing do do a little bit as well and they do do a bit of accreditation then you've also got stonewall the main charity that do do some care accreditation and they will come in and do training as well um so there are some um so yeah the pride in practice so the lgbt thank you martha um the pride in practice the lgbt um foundation one is more nhs and um, let me just i've just popped the um opening doors pride in care quality standard that's it, pride in care. Well. thank you um so that's the opening doors london one and that is a little bit more social care first um the pride in care standard um and i have spoken to them about that and it looks like a really fantastic award to do um but there isn't something that's standardised, and it'd be quite nice if we could maybe have one stamp, um, really, or maybe those two organisations. So that they might be. I'm. I'm not. I don't work for them. But they might be working with each other to actually benchmark it against each other. But it'd be nice to see that than having this division. Exactly what we were talking about before the health and social care division. Really, it should really be the same type of thing that's working with each other. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, do we need to say something tonight for people who may be afraid of getting it wrong? Um, I know uh, people are afraid to misgender people and, and to make mistakes. Um, and I know there's a lot of genuine um, misgendering that does go on, but people are afraid to then be attacked because of it. So I think there needs to be just, you know, like the NHS needs to work with care. Um, I personally, from this community, I just think we all need to be um, accepting and understanding of what everyone is doing on this journey. And if people do want to become allies and want to support the the, the journey with us, shouting and, and, and bawling at them when they make one simple mistake is, is not the way to do it. Yeah. But like you say, if they make it repeatedly, then that's microaggressions mm-hmm. that, that need to be addressed, isn't it? Um, sorry. I think without being blunt, I do think the phrase, it's not about you, it's about the person that you've upset, really comes to mind. I think quite often the people say, oh, I'm really afraid of upsetting somebody. You're putting too much emphasis on your own feelings in this situation. I'll be really honest. I know that sounds really hard to hear sometimes, but I think sometimes you need to just hold your hands up and say, look, I'm really sorry I've upset you. I'm going to work on fixing this. Then actually being upset with the upset because you've caused the upset then you need to work from it. And I think if everybody done that, 
the upset with being upset would then come down dramatically because the frustration is when somebody misgenders you, you then get this massive defense on why somebody's done it. And then you can't even say how you feel then. And I think it's about allowing the person to say how they feel. And I think that's really important, but I do think mistakes are happen. And I think people do generally understand a mistake. Um, and we, do quite and I'm saying myself as a non-binary person if somebody misgenders me I I understand if it's a mistake and that is fine um but then if I do get upset allow me to be upset and I think that that's it but it's also not personal against you it's quite often the fact that I have to deal with constantly being misgendered I walk out the door and I hear people saying oh look at his big pink beard I'm constantly being misgendered so at times I might get upset and you and in one way, it's not you, maybe. You could just be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And I think sometimes it's about understanding that and how microaggressions build and how misgendering and using the wrong labels do build. Yeah. And it's something that, yeah, you know, and this isn't just within within care or within, within um, society. It's something me and my partner try and consciously do at home. And, you know, a lot of people go, but... Oh, they, them, it's so hard to get used to. It's just so hard to get used to. And it's like, yeah. but for as long as the English language has been a thing and we've had they, them in the language, you've always gone, they've been to the shops. They've yeah. bought that. That's their drink. So it's about, for me, if it's for people that I don't know, consciously trying to use mm -hmm. they, them until I discover what their, their pronouns are. Um, mm -hmm. And we also try and do it, and this sounds very privileged, and I apologise if this comes across offensive. I don't mean it to be. We try and stop ourselves from identifying people by their characteristics in television shows and movies. So we won't go, oh, it's the old one. Oh, it's the it's the black person. It's the Asian person. It's the gay person. We will consciously try and think of other things about that person that make up their character mm. than a gender or a race or an age mm. to become their defining characteristic. Because you don't do it with Tom Cruise. You go, oh, it's Tom Cruise. You know, mm. you don't go, oh, it's it's... The, the one that has to stand on a soapbox because he's, he's shorter than all his co-stars and he doesn't want women being taller than in a movie. Um, and, and it's about just making those conscious shifts, isn't it? I feel, anyway, in my head. I do think that's always quite an interesting point because these defining characteristics, it's quite often we, we work to try and not see them, but then at the same time we erase them. And I think yeah. while what that that's brilliant and, like, I always have this. I always get into debate in the pub. You will always hear me in a corner debating with somebody about something. And it's normally language based because I'm I, I love talking about language because you can squirm yourself out of anything when you talk about language. But basically, when people say, oh, I don't see colour, I don't see sexuality or I don't see you as anybody different. I'm like, I want you to see me as somebody different, because if you can't see that, you can't do person centred care. So these defining characteristics, they definitely exist and they are there to a certain, to be, certain degree to be seen, but they are not there to define somebody. And I think that's where that self-identification comes in. Once somebody self-identifies as a defining characteristic, then it becomes an important person to somebody. So I agree with you 100% what you said. I, I just want to put that disclaimer that quite often this idea of I don't see that can lead to being a microaggression in itself. Was well, it the same, Moana? You know who you are, but this does not define you. Uh, anything to bring it to a Disney movie? <laughs> uh, it's usually in Cantor at the moment. So, uh, running to the end of the show, I think top three tips for care providers um, in adapting to uh, making sure that they're inclusive to LGBTQIA plus people. Maybe one around care plans, one around uh, culture within the home, and maybe one around uh, memory lane walls. Oh, kill them. Um, so, yeah, so if we think about care plans, it's about it's really important to be able to ask the questions. Um, we quite often, particularly in Britain, we're very coy about asking about sexuality and gender identity, um, more so here. But then I think also it's partly a generational thing. It is partly what people deem to be appropriate. But I think ask the questions, um, don't assume. And when we think about that, be able to document it everywhere, what people like to be known as, what people, who people are. 
So I think that's that care plan within culture. It's about having an open policy about being able to discuss anything, be it being open, embracing everything, and it should be top down heavy. Um, and it's about think about that central watching. What I was talking about is how can we break down? Can we look at anything? And are we just promoting heterosexuality or cisgendered people? with what we are doing if we are and this is the same with all D edi you can always go to the dominant point are we only promoting the dominant aspect or characteristic etc and if we are how can we make this embraced and norm and then my last point about memory lanes is please don't have a memory lane well not in your main corridor that goes up to your dining room or or etc because what you're doing is you're forcing people to relive trauma um this isn't just for the lgbtq community this can be people from the war and when they go up um along the memory lane where you've got war uniforms their ptsd might come back etc um so reminiscence is incredibly important but think about it should be an opt-in it shouldn't be a forced activity whereas if you have it along your main corridors it's a forced activity so think about what could this do? Could this bring back trauma? Doesn't mean you don't do reminiscence, but maybe you need more time. Maybe you need to go to a um, sensitive area or a very private area and have the time to then support the person afterwards if painful memories do come up. So that is my bit of a rant, a very quick rant on memory lanes, because they do frustrate me when they're the, always the main corridor and you're just forcing people to do trauma or go through trauma, really. Well, I mean... I know this has been a huge whistle-stop tour for a lot of people in uh, in welcoming um, LGBTQIA plus into uh, into into the world of care. Um, just a quickie, the plus. If anyone is wondering on LGBTQIA, I know it's a mouthful. Um, it's there to uh, recognise that actually there's there's a lot more genders and sexual orientations in in positions that people identify as. Um, it's just the acronym would become incredibly long, and we don't want people to feel left out. Um, hence the plus. Um, but Phil, thank you so much for tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. I, I mean, I've learned loads, and I thought I you know I was sat here going, oh, I'm part of this community. I know everything, and I've just sat here tonight soaking it all up of uh, stuff I never even thought about. Um, Mark Dawn, anything before we close? I think, you know, I've I've kind of become a little bit known for being a bit trappy, but I've been right quiet this evening. You've shut me up, Phil. I've accept, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've taken all this in, in my little brain, and now I'm, you know, I tend to then start stalking people on Twitter asking questions. So be prepared for that later, because I've, I've literally absorbed everything you've said for the last hour. So thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I'm the same. I think it's great for awareness. I think a lot of people would be watching this and it's a good starting point. And then obviously, like Dawn said, to then go away and kind of do your own research and ask questions and kind of build on that knowledge foundation that you've kind of given us all. Yeah, and my Twitter is always open. Like You can always message me. I'll probably regret saying that now. Um, <laughs> but, but as I said, anybody can message me if there's anything I can help with please do follow me on Twitter, find me, or you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, like quite easy to find on those. Uh, and just send me a message, anything I can help with, I'm more than happy to help with. All I want to say is, why didn't you come on Dragon and, and give us a song, you know? I, I, you fully expected, I fully expected a drag performance. Like, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, don't worry. <laughs> If if I wasn't working, I was tempted to see whether I could finish early and be here in drag. So maybe for a future one, maybe you never know. If there's anything else in the future, it could be a possibility. Absolutely fun. Oh, honestly, absolutely fantastic. I know the comments have been going off tonight. A lot of praise for you tonight, Phil, in the comments about trying to keep up the good work and, and, and thank you for, for, for bringing this to awareness. Please don't disappear before uh, when, when, when we go, Phil. We'll, we'll have a quick chat with you once we go off air. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure to discuss this. Thank you, Mark and Dawn, um, for having this on. I know it's a, it's a difficult topic. It's obviously something that I felt quite passionate about and it's, it's been nice to be able to talk about and and to raise that awareness and care. Uh, next week's another uh, awareness uh, week, really, and it's around hearing loss and and um, death awareness. Um, we've got Rachel Barber joining us. Um, Rachel is an ex-care manager and is uh, also a training provider um, and is also living with, with hearing loss, has done since birth. So really looking forward to next week's as well. I think it's a, a bit of an awareness at the moment for, for social care now that 
life's returning to normal, we need to focus on other things other than COVID. So this is it's a nice reprieve. It's a nice re respite. Um, and I'm not surprised next week. You'll be surprised <gasps> at my skills. Oh, I, I, ooh, I've got an idea, but I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. But I've got an idea. <laughs> Are you doing sign language next week, Dawn? For God's sake, Mark! I just said I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> well, spoiler alert! You have ruined it. I'll join you. I'll no, you can. Thank you. I've been practicing and everything. I can only. I can only do the alpha. I can do the alphabet in full. Honestly, we're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, and we will see you next week at 7.30 here on YouTube at The Caring View. Good night, everyone. Thank you again for joining us tonight on The Caring View. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And whilst you're here, check out some of the other videos that we've got up online. If you've got something that you think may be interesting for us to discuss, or if you want to guest spot with us, then drop us an email to thecaringview at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, find us on Facebook, all the information is down there in the description box. But until then, have a good evening, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.